Today's episode of the BS Podcast with Kurt Russell is brought to you by SeatGeek. That's our presenting sponsor. Find the best tickets for sporting events, music, wrestling, opera, hockey playoffs, basketball playoffs, you name it. I have SeatGeek on my phone. It's by far the easiest way to shop for the best tickets, thanks to their revolutionary grading system, which I urge you to try because I think there's going to be some great chances to get good playoff tickets this month. Buy and sell tickets, just two taps on your phone, everything fully guaranteed. Try it out. Download the SeatGeek app today or go right to SeatGeek.com. Just do it for me. We're also brought to you by TuneIn. Major League Baseball is back. The Ringer Podcast Network has baseball fans covered with the Ringer MLB show, which is playing for free on the TuneIn app for the month of April. Download the TuneIn app for free. Listen to Ben Lindbergh and Michael Bauman break down baseball's biggest stories through the opening month of the MLB season. Hopefully they can figure out why Byron Buxton continues to murder my fantasy team. I, I just can't forgive him anymore. But as a bonus for Ringer listeners, the Ringer Podcast Network has partnered with TuneIn to give baseball fans a free 60-day trial of TuneIn Premium to listen to every live home call from every MLB game around the league. Catch the Ringer MLB show only on TuneIn for April for free. And when you upgrade to TuneIn Premium, you get live MLB games. Go to TuneIn.com slash Ringer and subscribe. Download the TuneIn app for free. Start listening today. TuneIn, your everything audio app. And one reminder, I am on the Ringer NBA show podcast with Chris Vernon. End of this week to break down the first round of the 2017 NBA playoffs. You will not be getting basketball talk on this last podcast before the playoffs because you're getting Kurt Russell. And by the way, I wrote an MVP column that's up on the ringer.com. So if you haven't seen that yet, check it out. And that's it. Bring us in Pearl Jam. All right, I'm here with Kurt Russell. Um, warning, there's probably going to be some Snake Plissken talk in this one. <laughs> but uh, you're in Fast 8. I thought you died in Fast 7 or you were close to dying. Or well, there was a question worried. as to whether or not I was. You know, yeah. And, when, and it, we, we kind of wrote it that way, which is um, there's, there's a helicopter on the way. And they decided to have the helicopter get there in time to save his life. So, you yeah, recovered from there. your injuries. You yeah. did it. Yeah, well, he's always sort of three steps ahead of the game, this yeah. Mr. Nobody character. And... Uh, He's got. You don't know where his money comes from. You don't know what side he's on. You don't know what his history is. You don't know anything about him. And they, I mean, the Vince character takes a real leap of faith with him in Seven because he he doesn't know who he is. Yeah. And none of the people ever know his name. They don't know exactly who this guy is. But he's obviously connected to something. And so, so far, so good. So far, he seems to be a positive, positive, uh, a positive influence. influence. Yeah. But, so when they tell you you're playing this character, and they're like, "There's basically." There's no background. You just kind of have to it figure it out. That wasn't written that way. Yeah. Um, to be honest with you, uh, I was really impressed that uh, when they talked to me about doing it, and however that came about, I'm not, I don't really don't know. But um, uh, I, I I said, gee, you know, it'd be fun to kind of get in here and, and have some fun. But if you're going to do that, let's let's make the guy interesting. And uh, I don't think a, a first lieutenant of a special ops guy showing up is really. I'm, you know, okay, right. whatever. But I said, let's make him a mystery character. And uh, let's put that on the shoulders of this character so that uh, the other characters in, in the franchise have to deal with, who is this guy? You yeah. Know, wh where does he come from? And Vin's character has Dominic Toretto, doesn't really know. But he does take a bit of a leap of faith because he needs to, and some of him needs to, and he, he has his own gut feelings and stuff. But... By making him a character, I said, literally, I think he should be called Mr. Nobody. I, I, not Mr. I said, he's just nobody. He, when he's introduced in the first one, he just says, who are you? And he says, I'm nothing. I'm nobody. And he's sort of developed into this Mr. He, you know, he, he has a Mr. quality to him. So I guess he becomes Mr. Nobody. Right. But uh, the, you, you don't know. I don't. I, I, and I think that, you know, that adds to a, an interest, interest of him and with him in an entertaining way. It's a movie that doesn't really need to be promoted because it's probably the most reliable franchise we have right now other than Star Wars. Through all your years of doing different movies, is there a, a right way to promote a movie? Is there a magic formula? That's a very formula? interesting question. That's a really good question. Uh, I'm, I'm of mixed feelings about it. I've done both, where you go out and promote it to the world, uh, promote it to death. 
Uh, I've done it where uh, many times I've done it in my past, probably to my own detriment, to where I just didn't do anything. Yeah. Um, Mike Nichols and I had a conversation one time about that. It was like he was talking about he was talking about the fre- uh, not the uh, not the freshman. What am I trying to? What's what was his uh, the graduate graduate? And he said, you know, there was nothing about that movie. There was Mike Nichols was not someone the world knew or anybody knew outside of New York, really, uh, in Los Angeles. Um, Dustin Hoffman was brand new and et cetera. And he said there was absolutely no publicity about it. And there was a screening, I think, a couple of nights before the movie was going to open. And, and he came to the screening and they were lined around the block. How did they know? That movie needed no, it was going to literally live off the word of mouth. Now, granted, it's a different, different time. But you're always dealing with white noise and trying to rise above it. Yeah. There are many different ways to do it. If you have a great, great, great movie that everybody just loves, somehow it comes out of that it comes out of that projection room and the word starts to get out there. And then there are other movies you can promote them until the cows come home. And as Mike said, nobody wants to see it. They just don't want to see it. So having done it both ways, I think that what you do is you kind of hope that the one that they're that the studio is choosing is 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 the one that works and they have to do their best. I do think that that has changed a lot yeah. in the last 30 years in that I think it's very difficult now because I think they're all gone. All the guys who are artists at and in the marketing world at knowing how to promote a good movie. Now they know how to promote an event. It's very difficult for them to promote a good movie and get as much response to it as it deserves. And so they've painted themselves into an interesting corner now, I think. But uh, we always seem to find a way out. So Yeah, event movies, comic book movies, franchise mm-hmm. movies, those seem to be able to promote themselves. And then... Well, they don't, though. They have millions and millions yeah, you, and millions a, yeah. of dollars. <laughs> if you put millions, millions and millions and millions of dollars into, uh, I don't know, Moonlight, would you have a movie that goes out there and does four or five hundred million dollars no. because it's really good? I don't know. It's like, it's like, again, it goes back to what Nichols was saying. They're either going to go or they're not. And then there's a George Lucas uh, theory of the binary theory of filmmaking, which I also happen to believe in, which is the minute they hear the title understand what it's about and who's in it they're either going or they ain't i thought did you follow what happened with get out like two months ago i thought that was a really effective yeah, marketing strategy yeah well i don't know if it was a strategy or if it was just what they had to do yeah but uh the movie found its way now i've done but it was a good movie m- that that that's also really helps point. Yeah. i mean that, that's the point I, I i've been involved with movies that were movies that eventually because they heard about it they wanted to see yeah only in my case thank god for cds and and uh videotape and all that that came in because if it didn't catch when it first came out things like big trouble in little china the thing escape from new york was fairly well it was just a small release so there was just nowhere to go with it tombstone uh, i mean i can go on I, I overboard i've done probably 10 movies that had it not been for the afterlife yeah, they wouldn't have. They wouldn't have seen the light of day. And, I want to talk know. about all those movies. I want to try something a little different with you. I don't think I've ever done this on a podcast. I wanted to go through your IMDb. You said you've never done this before. I've never done this before. All right, let's, I've let's I've done go. a lot of podcasts too. I've never done let's this do something before. You've never done before. I like that. Um, <laughs> but going way way back because I'm I'm a child of the mid '70s when all we had on was Gilligan's Island and Brady Bunch. Mm-hmm. And you were Jungle Boy on Gilligan's Island. Yeah, that's well. How old were you as Jungle Boy? I was thirteen. So you were you're one of the rare cases of the child actor who actually became the successful adult actor and well, didn't I think go crazy. There's a lot of reasons for that um, because I think a lot of them just found another life that they preferred. You know, yeah. They, they, I think that you know they were, some of them were really good actors and they just decided to do something else. Others were more effective and perhaps best effective as a child actor and then as they grew and changed that became something that didn't uh didn't work as well i i just never looked at it one way or the other i just always looked at it as playing a part you know it was just a i was a guy playing a part i was i never felt like i was a kid playing a part you know? right you know, i didn't i didn't do you understand do you understand some of the uh dangers of when somebody becomes famous or well known as a child actor and then it seems like it derails them a lot of times oh i understand it well yeah. So what were the lived biggest it, dangers lived, for you? I've through it. I've watched yeah. it. I've lived it. Let's I've, hear I've, about you know. it. What were the big dangers? No, I, my, well, the dangers have been documented. I mean, that have happened to, to many, many of those young actors. Um, it just wasn't my future. It just wasn't where I was going. It wasn't what I was interested in. I wasn't interested in it for a lot of the reasons that I think perhaps 
made life difficult for some of those people. Yeah. And, uh, but it's not that I didn't experience the same pressures, the same realizations, the same difficulties. Um, I just kind of dealt with it differently. Rode the waves. What do you remember no, about Gogan's Island? Waves. I did not. I didn't, that's like, I, that reminds me of a thing. I met a guy one time. I remember there was a big, there was a phrase one time, which was go with the flow. Yeah. That was just not me. <laughs> <laughs> I was never a go with the flow guy, no matter whether it was hip or not. And so, like I said, sometimes to, to my detriment, but I, I just, it's just not, it just wasn't my look at life. And I was doing other things too. You know, I had other interests and baseball was one of them. And it was, I was serious about that. So, um, i took that to the professional level and was injured out of the game after three years. What position were you? Second baseman. And, um, you know, that was what I was spending the most and great part of my life, uh, working on, um, because that's a season and that's a continuous, uh, you must quickly and continuously improve to be able to rise up the ladder. And that's a black and white game. How many runs did you knock in that year? How many big runs? How many times did you pop up with a man on first, with men on third base, and nobody out or one out, and not move the runner home? How many errors did you make? How many games did you cost us? How many? What was your impact? Were you an impact player, or were you just one of the guys on the club that kind of? Mm-hmm. Did you play on winning teams? Did you help? It's all that stuff. It's black and white. You can look at stats and say that guy is good. Yeah. This is not that business. This is a what? It's a subjective look at uh, your opinion of something and. It's entirely different. One is a create. You, it, you know, you can get into the weeds about it. One is a creative business where you go to work every day and you create something uh, tangible out of thin air. The other one is tangible. Period. Right. And the audience reaction is immediate. Strike three. Boo. <laughs> Base hit. <laughs> knock the run in. Yay. Feels good. Feels bad. You learn to pace yourself. Taking some of that knowledge into this business, which my dad did both. My dad was a professional ball player, and he was uh, an actor. Um, and we had conversations about that, and you know, um, just sort of osmotically, I, I think I received a lot from my dad and other men around him in the world of baseball and in the acting, and uh, sort of made my own way. What was the injury in baseball? Uh, rotator cuff. Ah, oh. leading the Texas League at the time. So, Were you really? Yeah, yeah, I was. I was going Texas to, League, so that's, that's up to, there. Yeah, good league. Um, I was going to be going to Salt Lake in a week. And uh, at the time, the second baseman for the Angels was hitting, I think, 138 or something. So I was headed there. But, again, people ask me all the time, you think you could have played in the big league? Well, of course you can play there. Anybody, you could have played in the big league. I don't even know if you I ever played have in baseball. Played. Yeah, you could. <laughs> it's whether or not you could succeed Yeah, is the question that can only be answered by playing 14, 15 years, you know, again, without injury, because you'd even, you know, you might have three, four good years and then they begin to figure you out and, and you don't begin to figure them out and you're going downhill and you're out of the game. You have to continually in that game, uh, figure out how you have to find a way. You have so to wait, find a so way. So what kind of second baseman were you? Were you like the power and no, I was a bad amber? Were you a speed guy? What were you? No, I had, um, I had a little better than average speed, but I was, uh, I was a good infielder, went to my left very well, went to my right okay, but I turned a double play with anybody. Yeah. And um, I was, uh, you know, my career average in pro ball was 293, and I was, uh, before that, I, you know, I, I'd i always hit well. I was a switch hitter. I could do a lot of things. Move, I could move runners. I was, I was good at uh, hitting the ball the opposite field. I was a real student of the game. My dad was a, a real student of the game, yeah. and, and I grew up with that. And I was also a student of a, of a man named Hank Robinson, who was a, a great, again, in, in an osmotic way, great guy to emulate in terms of hitting and understand hitting and feel like a hitter and, and begin to understand the things about yourself. Whereas my dad was also someone who uh, made me keep books on, or taught me to keep books on pitchers and understand who they are and begin to find out who the man is and, and wh- what he wants to go to in a certain situation. And then, of course, he's doing the same thing on you. It's a real yeah. psychological it's a real psychological game, psychological war. And, you know, all the players, for the most part, once you get to a higher level, they're all pretty good, you know. Quick break to talk about Lyft. Looking for a ride share option that will get you there safely with a smile on your face? With Lyft, you can get a ride in minutes for less than the cost of a cab. Every Lyft driver is fully vetted through their 10-point safety standard, including criminal and DMV background checks. And you can tip them in the Lyft app which obviously leads to happier and better drivers. Nine out of 10 Lyft rides get a perfect five-star rating from their passenger. 
Every car on Lyft has to pass a 19-point vehicle inspection for your safety and comfort. And Lyft's new AMP device uses a color-coded system to help you easily find the right car. No more saying your name to your driver through a cracked window. It's also the fastest-growing rideshare app and the highest-rated one. And it's your buddy whenever you need a ride. Right now, Lyft is offering our listeners a special deal. And this is a good one. Get three free rides for up to $10 each, up to a $30 value when you enter promo code Bill Simmons. All you have to do is download the free Lyft app today. That's Lyft with a Y, L-Y-F-T. Enter promo code Bill Simmons in the payment section. Easy to remember because that's my name. You get three free rides for up to $10 each. L-Y-F-T. Try it out today. Lyft. Back to Kurt Russell. I don't understand why you weren't in a baseball movie. They're, they made like a hundred baseball movies. Yeah, they're all bad, except for a few. <laughs> <laughs> there was one that I was going to do, and it's actually kind of an, an interesting, fun story. Uh, uh, Ronnie Shelton and I were together uh, working on a different movie. Uh, yeah. Uh, I forget the, it was uh, Best of Times, I think it was, and um, <clears throat> which Ronnie had written. Yeah. Uh, and uh, he, at one point he said, you know, we should, we should do the baseball movie. It's never really been written the one that we would like. And I yeah. said, yeah. And he said, why do you think that is? And I remember saying, because it's always written from the fan's point of view. It's always written by a, a writer who was a fan of the game. It's not written by a guy who played the game, and that's probably why. And I said, I think the point of view should literally, and we both agreed because we were saying it at the same time, should be from the point of view of a woman. you got to understand that baseball, especially in those days, I think it's changed a little, but at heart, baseball players are still the same. We would prefer to play in front of uh, a full crowd of all women. We don't care if there's any men in the stands. <laughs> he just, it, has, it was no, of no interest that there were men in the stands. It was only that, who's that girl in the third row? You, yeah. know, you, know, you know, in the it's on deck the circle. Horniest, in the on the the deck circle, sport. You, yeah. and, you and the guy in the hole are talking about important things in life. Like, who yeah. is? Do you see that blonde over there? And um, <laughs> it had to be told from the point of view of, of that, that person, that, that view. And I thought Ronnie did a great job of locking into that and finding that. So anyway, um, um, make a longer story, fun story short. Um, uh, Kevin Costner ended up doing that movie because he could get a better deal with Costner at the time than he could with me at different studios and whatnot. So so uh, you could was, have been Crash Davis. Well, a lot of that's my life story. <laughs> as, yeah. as Ronnie put it, what do I do? I said, go make the movie and die. <laughs> we remained, I say that as we remain great friends and we got to do a, a movie that I really love doing with Ronnie. Um, called Dark Blue, and it's one of my favorite experiences as an one. actor. Yeah, uh, and Ronnie's a terrific. Would have been nice to be Crash actor. Davis, though. Uh, yeah, I think so. I, I've, I, I very, very rarely have. <laughs> it's written. a great speech in that. Well, movie. I've very written that. Well, oh, you mean the cockeye fastball? The, 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 Thank uh, you. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I. Uh, uh, well, no. There's another speech which is, you know, the toughest thing a manager has to do is let a ball. And I, that was how I answered my phone call to Ronnie when I was going to have the conversation about what happened here. Yeah. yeah. Um, but no, uh, uh, I forgot what I was going to say there about Ronnie. But I'm, just, I'm a fan, and I think he's a, a, has done some great stuff and terrific stuff. And I'm just really glad we got the opportunity to work together. He's been a, a good friend of mine for a long time. And anyway, the, there's only a few, as far as I'm concerned, um, baseball movies that are are really in any way, shape, or form connecting to the real thing. And that one's got a little. Even that one's got a little bit of a of a slap shot aspect to it. Um, it's a little more of a uh, rom. I've never seen. I, I don't think there's ever been a um, a movie, as far as I'm concerned, that is centered around a ball player. That is a drama that you really get involved in. That's not just the fun, boyish aspect of what's great about the game of baseball and how it connects to Americans. What do you think of For Love of the Game? Because I think that tried to do a lot of yeah, what I you're talking about. Yeah, I liked For Love of the Game. I don't remember seeing it a lot. And I don't know if I've seen it from the top. Was that the perfect game? Costner, perfect, perfect game. Costner, perfect game. It got lost in like this whole rom-com side of yeah. it. And it the I, baseball yeah. stuff again, was much I, better. Again, you know, it's, it, it, that's, you know, that's... It's good. I, I remember reading it, uh, watching it, and uh, it's good. Oh, what I was going to say, I know what I was going to say. I don't want to say it. Uh, I've never written fan letters and did anything, but after, and I was really, you know, I was, I didn't really care if they did succeed it or not once I was going to do it because it hurt a little bit because it was a lot of my life. Yeah. And uh, I went to the, watch the movie the day it came out, and I wrote Costner and Ronnie Shelton the fan letter and said, way to go, guys. You, you, you did great. You really did great. Because I, I was impressed with what Kevin was able to do with it. Had I played it, would it have been different? Yeah. Um, and so yeah, you always, you know, ifs, ands, and Peter Pans, who cares? Field of Dreams, yes or no? Eh. 
Hmm? It's 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 like the natural. I liked it. I like it for its. Uh, I like it for what it's about. You know, it's a dream. It's I love a, the natural. It's a thing, and 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 I get what's really touching about it. As a ball player, it, it's not touching on the things I'm. They, that I'm, resonate with you. Yeah, that resonate with me. As a, I love to see major league. I love to see. It. No, that's just a clown show. So that's fun. I mean, it's fun. Look, it's it's fun. But you, again, it's that's written from. I think a, that's you got to write the fan. movie. You got to do it. Well, that's you know, yeah. I mean, there's that possibility. But now I'm long, long from being no, that, I don't that think, interested in the game. You know. Listen, if Redford can play the natural at age 55 or whatever well, it was, I think you can. I that think you be a the long question. Re- I know I'm a Robert Redford fan, but <laughs> don't give me a. Four, he was I think he was 46 actually. I looked into it. and I was like, he's 46. You know, but it's sweet. Wonder Wonder Boy was a cool. It's a, that's a cool. It's a Sandlot approach it's like what's it's what's dreamy about it it's not it's not the the perils and the reality of the difficulty of the psychology of a human being who has one way out and that is baseball that's with a bat a glove and a ball can you get to a level of living a life that you want to through that through those instruments that's a for me because I lived it. It was a comp- that's a compelling thing. It wasn't a clown show, for right? Me, for me, it wasn't a, and for me, it was interesting because wherever I went as a young ball player, you know, to the, to the to the fans who didn't know anything. Southern California, everybody knew they all the ball players know each other because you play, you can, and if you're gonna play pro ball, you're gonna go through Southern California at some point. So I knew about all the ball players, and the ball players knew me. But the fans that I went to the, you know, the uh, uh, visiting um, ballparks, they only knew me. <laughs> they only knew me as an actor, like yeah. a Disney actor, and was like, "What? What is this? What, what is this?" So it was kind of always fun for me and some of my ball player friends because they said, "Well, they're going to find out this guy can hit." Right. And um, anyway, that's, that's what about what right? if you're a retired pitcher who decides to get back in and just takes a ton of HGH to try to have one more season. That could, you, that's not the way to do it. No? Okay. As All a retired, right. no, you better go. I'm, I'm trying no, to help I, you I out with the baseball with, I, worked very, I worked at one time fairly closely with the guy who did come back late in age, and it's not HGH. There's only one pitch you're going to do that with. Knuckleball. That's it. What if you're... Jim Bouton came back with a knuckleball. What if you're uh, he was a on retired the pool, knuckleballer? He was, well... If you're ret- knuckleballers are never retired, <laughs> you know. They're, if they if they if they if they throw the good knuckleball <laughs> on that day, script. you ain't gonna hit it. But I mean, that's just the way it is. But but Bouton came to the Portland Mavericks, which was a club that my dad and I owned. And well, that was the Ball Four sequel, yeah, right? Yeah. Well, no. Have you ever seen um, uh, Batter Bastards of Baseball? Yeah. Yeah. That okay. So Bouton was with that club, and he was starting his comeback, and my dad gave him his chance, as it were. A place to go to get started again, and uh, and I caught him quite a bit when he was working. I had a pretty good knuckleball myself, so we we kind of talked about it. his knuckleball really could move. Mm. And when he when he had control of it, and he had you know I think I think he when he made it back to the big league, I believe it was with the Giants, and I think he went four and two. And he was I don't know how old he was. Well, the Negro so, brothers you know, were in their mid forties. Well, yeah, I mean if you can throw you know, two hundred innings, Tim Wakefield, and I mean you can go yeah. through the list. Well, you know. So, Elvis was your big break. You think the TV movie? I remember watching it was my that big as change. a kid. His big, big, big chance. Your big break is always your first job. Yeah. Um, which in my case was a um, our man Higgins. I don't even okay. remember where it was. So your big chance. But your big, your big, your bre- my big. Then I had a chance at Disney. You know, when I got uh, went over there to do Follow Me Boys, uh, that was a motion picture break. And working with with Elvis Presley in in uh, it happened at the World's Fair when I was just ten years old. That was an opportunity, and then playing him. Was, was he still such, alive when you were filming it, or no? No, it was. Uh, it was written when he was still alive. But yeah, he died, and so it added a degree of difficulty to it because there was this sense of, gee, it's only been eighteen months since Elvis died, and they're already doing this. You know, that that's sort of the way things were at that yeah. time. You didn't you didn't jump on that. It looked it was bad form, but this was already in in the in the in motion. But it was um, it was stepping out so far. I mean, there's a really nice man, um, actor, and Treat Williams, very good actor, and he and I were kind of one of some of the guys that were <clears throat> one of the t- three or four or two uh, down at, to the last. Who's it going to be? And I remember Treat one time and said, "He said, if you, said, if, you if you get this, are you going to actually do it?" <laughs> and I said, "What? What do you mean?" He said, "I said, what about you?" He said, no, "I don't know." And I said, "Why? What, what do you mean?" He said, well, "Come on, it's like you know, I don't know. It's, you're playing Elvis. I mean, this is like." And Elvis, I, and said, I, yeah, the, it was like, the I said, biggest. Yeah, star. I never thought of that. I just yeah. thought, well, it's just, a, it's just a job. It's just, you know. Um, but I had confidence in 
doing it. And I'd actually kind of fooled around, you know, in my life. I, I but play, I fooled around my life, imitating, thinking about Elvis doing it with some on the on the bus with ball players. You know, but when you're going to do it seriously, it's a whole different thing. But I did have my experience working with him for a couple of weeks uh, to draw on, which had happened 17 years earlier. Uh, but that was primarily what I got to draw from. And then I had a lot of material given to me to be able to look at because I didn't know much about Elvis Presley. Didn't I didn't know. Do you lip sync or do you actually sing? Lip sync. And it which and made it more difficult because I thought I was gonna sing. Yeah. And so I'm rehearsing these songs and getting them ready. And then about a week or two before we started shooting, in comes uh they never ever thought of me singing and doing it. And I was because I you know, and I was learning it from Elvis's songs. Yeah. So I was then I was learning to lip sync to Elvis as it were, but I was going to maybe do the voice. I didn't, we didn't know. And then they decided to go with, um, Oh, it's terrible. I can't know Ronnie. Yeah. It's terrible to not know the man's name. He's such a good, uh, he was such a, a really good singer and also had the ability to, uh, imitate Elvis, but it was slightly different. And I realized then that I had to kind of sell Elvis a little more because it wasn't his, it really you wasn't the his charisma voice. and the. It and just the, was different. I mean, it's not the, the it's not the original. Scowl, all that it's stuff. not the original. Well, you don't do that. You don't. You, you can't do that. You don't. You don't. The faces? No. No, you, that's not the way to go about it. Well, <laughs> Bill, that, Bill, you, you don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> that's just not the wrong approach. That's what, the wrong approach. <laughs> tell me what you do. You understand the human being. Okay. If I'm going to play you, yeah, I'm going to find out things about you. I'm gonna. I'm, I'm seeing your. I'm watching your. The way you sit, the way you think. You're on the. You. I'm, I'm sitting, sitting back. Comfortably right I'm now. sitting back. You and I are kind of different people that way. You're. You're comfortable, but you're no, forward. No, I, I didn't. I wanted but I'm to say if I'm like, gonna play you, I'm not gonna play you like I'm, I'm doing back. right now. Right. Yeah. Well, now you're doing me. Uh, <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> that's you playing it. me. Okay. But I'm just telling you how I would do it, which is you. You get to understand the human being, and I, right. what I learned about Elvis was that Elvis, in a way, learned to play Elvis Presley. He wasn't that. And when you see him early in, his, early in his life, he's quite different than he became five, six, seven years later. Did you have to gain a lot of weight for like the last no, stage? We didn't, Elvis, we didn't get, we didn't that do that. Was, it was a uh, pull of De Niro. It was uh, before that. Ours finished in, in 69 when he came back in Vegas and he was going to go back on and he was very nervous about it and very unsure of what was going to happen. So. I, I remember loving it. I don't think it's been on. Sometimes these things come back. I can't remember the last time it's been even on. Yeah, I don't, I don't, Sometimes I don't, they just disappear into the. Hey, the I, you know, that was a good one. Yeah, that was a good one. Let's take a break to talk about Delta Airlines. It's no secret that traveling can be stressful, especially if you have one or more small kids. Then it becomes really, really stressful. You can have peace of your mind in your palm of your hand right now. With the Fly Delta app, the Fly Delta app will make your travel experience informed, connected, and seamless. It's with you every step of the way, giving you the timely information you need. Find, compare, and book flights on the go. Check your Sky Miles balance. Update your travel preferences to find a flight that's right for you. Make sure your time at the airport goes smoothly with interactive airport maps. Easy access to your boarding pass, gate and seat information, the ability to scan your passport during check-in, get alerted when boarding begins, rebook, cancel, or delay flights as soon as they occur, and you can keep tabs on your bags, too, because they deliver real-time bagging, bag tracking with RFID, which is radio frequency identification. I have been traveling for a long time, and traveling is a hell of a lot easier if you have apps like this Delta app. And I've used it because I love Delta. Being on the go doesn't mean being out of the loop. Discover all the ways Delta makes travel easier than ever before. Download the free Delta app on your iPhone, iPad. Or Android today. I don't have to tell myself because I already have it. All right, back to Kurt Russell. Escape from New York. One of my all-time favorites. John Carpenter. Great Who talent. also directed Halloween, which is another one of my all-time favorites. So I was predisposed to like this movie. An unbelievable premise. Although, yeah. in retrospect, it was 16 years later, New York City has been turned into a maximum security prison. Yeah. And now it's like... 36 years later it's it's maybe they should put that in like well, 2050 <laughs> yeah it's better word. Uh, i thought it was a great idea too it was unbelievable and, one of the uh, best ideas yeah. of any action movie yeah and and i had uh i i, I it was you know the, but the fact that john carpenter stuck to his guns and wanted to cast me at that time at that age with what i'd done in the past yeah um uh, there was the that was another uh, continuing wonderful opportunity and break for me yeah <clears throat> and i don't i very few directors would have would have looked at me and said 
I, I want him to play this part. Because the part itself was uh, uh, quite different from any, any, any character like that at the time. He wasn't it, a great guy. Well, that's the thing. It, all the movies with the, let's say, the 40-year-old uh, stalwarts of, of, of those kinds of, of a movie where a guy's going to get revenge or a movie's going to... But that was the point. I, I kind of jumped the gun there. All those characters had social redeeming values. Either yeah. their wives had been raped and burned in a western, their family had been run over by you know by the, the, the mafia had come in. Whatever the situation was, the lead guy had a reason that we knew of to go wreak havoc or to go do what he's going to do yeah. and not be very happy about it or not whatever. This one didn't have that. This was this was a guy who was something had happened to him. He was a war hero. And something had happened to him. Who lost he, his way. No, he didn't lose his way. He found his way. <laughs> when found you're a psychopath. Yeah, when yeah. you're a psychopath and you don't know, it's wonderful <laughs> to find your way. <laughs> and he just became a, a one-man, I don't give a shit, wrecking crew. Yeah. Who wasn't... And what's interesting about the movie is he's not a wrecking crew. He's just... He's very... It's a very quiet movie. People have a tendency to hear about an Escape from New York, then see it and kind of go... Oh wow, that's kind of really different than I imagined from what I've heard. It's not an action movie. No, it's a it's a movie about a guy who is there because he's got those things in his neck. Otherwise, he wouldn't be there, president or not. My favorite line in that movie is "President of what?" Right. You know, he just doesn't care. He he, he just doesn't care. He just you, you know, if you get deeper and deeper into Snake Plissken, which is you know they're talking about doing sequels and things like that to it. You have to understand some things about Snake Plissken, I think, that are very important. First of all, he's American. There's a reason he's in that ring with a baseball bat with nails in it. Yeah. Because I'm playing him. Yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty good with that bat in my hand. Yeah. <laughs> he was an American. Yeah. He's not an international guy. He's not James Bond. He's the, the negative James Bond. Uh, he's American. That's, that's a very important thing. And the other thing is, is that, you know, to get further into him, and if you watch the movie and you see it, he's... An escape artist, and the only thing he can't escape is himself, Wait, and I, that's that's the thing that makes him the way he is. Yeah. So anybody who's going to do the, he is what he's going to do in the future should, I think, look at that and begin to understand that about that character, and and you have to have a certain certain sense of humor, I think, to find the balance that makes it, him work for the audience. It's a Netflix series if it comes back. I think it's like 13 episodes yeah, I don't know. in I New mean, York you know, and a maximum I like security. Make, I like to make remakes because they are flawed. Either they're flawed in casting or they're flawed in the screenplay. Yeah. When it's not, when you don't have that, <clears throat> you face <clears throat> an uphill battle. In, in doing anything that you're going to do that John Carpenter did, you're facing a different battle. John Carpenter has a, a look at life that is just different from anybody else's. It's what gives him, I think, his great talent. My my rule on remakes is if if I can still watch it and I still enjoy the hell out of it, don't remake it. Well, there's nothing sacred, you know. I mean, John and I, I did. The I think Snake Pliskin's a but, little bit but, sacred. Well, yeah, I know what you mean <laughs> because people people feel I that just, way. I just I wouldn't enjoy you know, yeah, it unless people, people feel that way. Yeah, either, right. Well, or or at best, or at worst, I become Sean Connery, who is James Bond. I don't care. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, you can. I I know a lot of the guys that play. They're all really good. But Sean Connery. But Sean Connery is James Bond. Yeah, that's just the way it is. Um, so leave it alone, but I, I'm kind of that way, but it's like uh, John and I did the thing, which is a remake, but John didn't do the thing that was made as a movie. He did the book who goes there and they use the title, the thing and a movie. The thing is a movie that's connected to nuclear, the future of potential of nuclear power and what's, what's going to fall on your head from above. What's going to come to earth. The thing was a movie, the, the John Carpenter's The Thing is a movie that, that, as he said to me, I said, what's this movie about, John? He said, Paranoia. And I said, oh, great. <laughs> I mean, oh, that's cool. <laughs> that's cool. A, a seven foot carrot maybe was cool in the 50s. I don't know. But, um, I, I, you know, and, and that's and that's a great, Howard Hawks made a great movie. I mean, it's a classic horror film. I like, I like the sort of more thriller aspect or the psychological aspect of, of Paranoia. And if you put twelve people, twelve men, in a in McMurdo Station in the Antarctic, and you give them this particular problem, I I I, I like watching the human being, the, the the decay, you know, the decomposition of everything happening right. through your own, and finally to the point where you don't know for you don't know yourself if you're you, you know, 
And what if, we're, what if we're one. already all, what if we're all, what if, what if this happened and we're already just imitations of, of, of our ancestry? Um, I, I love that kind of what if stuff. Did Snake, you had to be at wear an eye patch the whole time? Snake, to me, was a guy who had been injured. I also wanted to, and John was great this way. I said, I, I think he should wear an eye patch. And, and John immediately went, yeah, nobody's worn an eye patch since John Wayne. And <laughs> Drew Grid, hey, wait, I like that idea. Why? I said, I don't know. It's just something about, I think that he's got an injury that will, he, will care, he will physically, visually carry with him. And if you mm. look at my snake, he's always slightly in pain. Like it's something like something happened to his eye that wasn't quite fixed. And it's, 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 it's a constant, he's trying to constantly look past it. Yeah. Or it has abilities that we don't know about. Oh, that's because it was a futuristic picture. Yeah. <clears throat> so maybe he's going to lift that eye patch at some time and <laughs> shoot you with it. <laughs> Something who knows, you know, the biggest flaw with that movie, as much as I love Donald Pleasance and he was the rock of Halloween, the American president with the foreign accent. Yeah. Well, that was the, no, that's intentional. What was intentional about it? It's the future. Even it's the future, it, yeah, think about it. Even the future doesn't. <laughs> the president doesn't come from here. <laughs> it's a that's a concern, and you right. got it. <laughs> Silkwood, you're with Meryl Streep, mm -hmm. the uh, the most successful actress of all time, mm -hmm. and the greatest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What do you remember I, about I, well, that was, one? Yeah, well, what I remember was you know um, you know um, meeting Mike Nichols, and, and it was great. Um, Mike. When I met him, I was doing a play. I was, you know, making a career move, doing a play in Los Angeles. I wasn't a stage actor, so I'd never done one, so I was going to do. And out of that came an interview with Mike Nichols to, to do this movie that he was going to be coming back after seven years of not having made any movies. And Meryl Streep was going to play the play that part, and I think she, and Cher was cast. She was it was going to be Meryl. I'm pretty sure that was the case. And they were casting this the guy who's kind of with both of them as friends and lovers and that kind of thing. <clears throat> and uh, I uh, went to meet Mike and I knew who Mike Nichols was. I'd, I'd, I'd love the, the graduate and I love catch 22 and look at once and so on. I think this would be interesting to talk about that stuff. And he sits down and he says right away, he said, <clears throat> now what would I know you from? Now I was 32 years old. I'd starred in a lot of movies. I'd been yeah. around for already. I'd been around for what? I started when I was, I'd been around for 22 years. But it struck me as very simple. Well, if you haven't seen me, you wouldn't know me from anything. So I said, nothing. What would you know me from? Nothing. I mean, that's, clear, that's clearly the, the, the answer. The, the, yeah. answer. The, the reality is you wouldn't know me. If you don't know me, you wouldn't know me from, you don't, you've just said you don't know me. And he went, okay. He said, do you want to read? And I said, well, I don't want to, but you know, I hate reading. I said, just, when you cold read, you just read yourself out of stuff. So I said, but I, you, if you want to read, I'm, I'm here. Let's, let's read. And he went, nah, 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 I guess not. No, no, no. And we talked for a few minutes, and he said, "That's." And he said, "Great, nice meeting you." And I thought, "Okay," you know, and that was that. And um, very quickly, Mike Nichols wanted me to do the movie, so I was going to do the movie. And then, about, I don't know, maybe a month and a half into it, somebody said, "Somebody asked him because it wasn't me." You know, why? Why did you? Why? Why was Kurt your your choice here? Because at that time, I was still the kind of actor that people were going, "What? What? What? Why is Kurt Russell working with Mike Nichols?" I don't get. I mean. Share what I get Meryl Streep, I get that, but what you know, but it was a mix that he was looking for, right? And he said, Oh, it's really simple. He said, uh, When I first met Kurt, I asked him one question and he answered it honestly. He said, And I and I, and I needed someone who the audience knew was absolutely 100% telling the truth, always. And I said, What was the question? And he said, I asked you if I, what would I know you from? And you said, Nothing. <laughs> I said, So I, I had my guy. <laughs> he said, Yep, that guy will tell you the truth. <laughs> now, that's what you're going to get. So that was what he wanted to see in that character. And also, someone who would uh, portray a guy who was honestly in love with Meryl Streep's character and could make you feel that, yeah, she had a, she had a man who loved her very much. And found her sexy and beautiful yeah. and and all that. It's it was great working with Meryl, yeah, uh, too, and Cher. I, I just we had a ball. We we all lived in close proximity, and and uh, it was just a wonderful experience, a great time. It always felt like uh, we were just sort of on the set living together and off the set living together. It was a real communal feeling. Um, we were all young and 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 enjoying 
just enjoying each other's company a lot. Yeah. Um, they they had children. It was really I had really fun uh, fun time with the, some of the children that that were in, that were around at that time. Shares and Merrill's and Don's killed children. And Merrill and Don and and uh, I became um, friend friends on that movie and have we 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 remained somewhat in contact with each other for the rest of our lives and wonderful people. They're great. She's a great person. And so is Don and shares a great a great interesting gal. Um, <laughs> It, it really just was a, but Mike was, you know, the leader of the leader of the little family that we, yeah. that we were having. And it was a, a, just a really wonderful experience. And I thought really a, an effective movie. One more break to talk about Sonos. One of our old friends here on the BS podcast. If you want to experience TV movies and musics with music or musics, musics as they call it sometimes after a few drinks with sound, you can feel from a speaker you hardly notice. Well, play bass from Sonos gives you just that. It's low profile design practically disappears beneath your TV, yet it fills your entire viewing room with epic home theater audio. I'm glad we're finally figuring this out. I've, I've been a lot of years where I haven't been satisfied with home theater audio. And now Sonos is here from movies and sports to TV shows and gaming. The slim low profile play bass adds dynamic pulse pounding sound to whatever's playing in your TV. It streams your favorite music when it's off was created for TVs that sit on stands and furniture, no wall mount required. One power code, one optical, one optical code is all it takes, and the Sonos app guides you through every step of setup. Playbase securely supports TVs up to 75 pounds, which covers just about any TV that comes with its own stand, unless you're Jimmy Kimmel, because I think his TV is about 290 pounds. And it works with almost all TV, cable box, and universal remotes. So the remotes you have are all you need. And that's important because who wants seven remotes? I certainly don't. Everything sounds better on Playbase. See for yourself. Go to Sonos.com and you can learn more. Once again, look for Playbase and go to Sonos.com. Back to Kurt Russell. Swing Shift, is that where you meet Goldie well, what's Hawn? What's interesting about that was Goldie Hawn was now going to do this movie and I was living in Colorado. So I was coming in, going to come in to meet the director and I thought, well, I'm going to come all the way from Colorado to meet the director. That's great that I'm, you know, being considered for the male lead in in this Goldie Hawn movie. But Gold, is Goldie going to be there? No, <clears throat> she's not going to be able to make it. I said, well, what's the point of me coming to meet the director if I'm going to eventually have to meet Goldie Hawn? Because if it's a Goldie Hawn movie, I'm sure she's going to have to say yes. So they, yep, they agreed, agreed with that and came in and kind of met. But when I, I came, the reason I thought it was really interesting for me, again, young act, young actor, not young-ish, but young actor at that time, I had just worked with the best and top of the, top of the line uh, dramatic actress in the world playing her uh, paramour. Yeah. And, uh, and now that was the opportunity to immediately do something quite different with the number one comedian, who was Goldie Hawn. Who had the title for, that was like year 10 of having that title too. Yeah, and 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 she was producing the movie as well. And yeah. So she was, you know, Goldie was, you know, uh, yeah, very different in that in, in, in how far ahead of the game she was. She was she was doing things no, no other women were doing. Yeah. And, uh, and getting that opportunity I thought was yeah regardless of what it is almost it's like let's go do this you want to work with Meryl Streep you want to work with Goldie Hawn you know this is this is this is a good thing to do and uh and I met Goldie and for the first time really uh I I married Susan Hubley off of meeting Susan when we did Elvis together and I I was always I'd always been a Susan Hubley fan I'd seen her in some in some television shows and things I just thought she was adorable she was great and we divorced uh, uh, less than two and a half years later or three years or something. And that was one of those things where, as a young man, I sort of said in the back of my head, well, okay, that actresses and you are not a good idea. That's just not a good idea. You know, you're, you, you, whatever your part is in it, Kurt, you're, yeah. you're responsible for that. Yeah. So take responsibility. and Stay away. Just realize something about yourself that you don't see. And then I met Goldie, and <laughs> for the first time ever, I'd, I'd never asked. Uh, uh, I can't remember asking an actress out on a date. I mean, I'd bit, spent time with actresses, but I don't remember saying, you know, let's go here or whatever. But I remember 
shortly after me, at the first thing I said when I walked through the door to meet Goldie, and I, I was terribly hungover because I was with my dad. I had just received, I think, my d divorce papers or something the night before, and I'd been with my dad at the bar till like four in the morning, had this early nine o'clock meeting. So I got up er early like to get down there and make sure I was there and just get on the couch and fall asleep. And I told the secretary, I I'm here when Goldie's ready and she's, you know, I, I, she said, well, you're early. I said, yeah, I just want to, I'm here. Look, just wake me up when, and I'll go in there. <laughs> Can I have some coffee? <laughs> you know, yeah, it was really, it was really rough. I mean, I'd been drinking heavy the yeah. night before with my dad. We were, we were, we were, you know, going over things. And uh, I just remember walking in the door. We said, you know, open the door and I walked in and here was this. Now I, I know who Goldie Hawn is, but I'm not a Goldie Hawn fanatic. I don't know everything she's done or anything. I'd seen her once, right? My, one of my, my, uh, uh, cousins had actually worked as an assistant director with her and my best friend Jimmy Van Wyke that was Jack Philbrick my best friend at the time one of my two best friends Larry Franco and Jimmy Van Wyke who were both in the business and I was very closely connected to um, had worked with her and they loved her they just thought she was great you know she's a great person and loved her anyway I <clears throat> that was pretty much what I knew about Goldie and I'd seen Laugh-In I was not a gigantic Laugh-In watcher uh, and, but Goldie and I had worked together in 1966 um, on the one and only genuine original family band with uh, at Walt Disney Studios. It was her first movie. She was a dancer. Mm. Now, I knew of that, but I didn't, you know, she had neither she or I remember that specifically. I mean, we saw each other and we were, I was 15, 16, and she was like, I don't know, late teens, 20. And uh, so now I'm meeting her really for the first time in 1982. And the door opened and she's standing and she had jeans on and uh, suspenders and a, and a tank top, you know, and I, I just, I, I, it literally came out of my mouth. Wow, you've got a great figure. <laughs> I, I, I had never thought of Goldie Hawn in, a, in, a, in that way, in a, in a like, you're built, man. Yeah. You look good. And, and, I, and I literally caught my... See, and instead of her going, get the fuck out of here, yeah. I don't know who you think you are. She kind of went, well, thank you. Oh, that's I, it. Now, she now went, you know. Well, thank you. And I said, yeah, I, I just, uh, sorry. I, uh, you know, she said, well, let's talk about the movie. I said, yeah. And I watched her put one hat, I take one hat off and put another hat on. And I was, uh, was immediately it. impressed. And we talked about it. And I was, I wasn't having any trouble like with my hangover. I was just, I was just having a great, fun, immediate conversation with this, 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 this beautifully figured really cute and increasingly fascinating girl uh, who was calling the shots. And uh, I didn't know where anything was with this. And again, I, I just been that actor. I didn't, you know, look, what's going to happen is going to happen. I didn't much care. I, I, you, 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 you can want something, whatever. You, you can go through your life wanting anything. Guys, you know, if it's meant to happen and you're meant to do it, and it's going to happen or not. And that was my, that was my point of view with it. And um, anyway, she, she decided that this was the one she thought was right for the movie. We then met again later with Jonathan Demme, who was young in his career. Wow. And became a t spectacular director. You cut, you cut some good ones early. Yeah, I did. Yeah. And, uh, and anyway, uh, very quickly, though, uh, when I met Goldie, I didn't. The movie was the movie, but I very quickly was like, hey, you know the thing in the back of your head about actresses? Fuck that. <laughs> <laughs> What's the uh, what's the deal with you? It was like the first day I went to work. I had to do this whole number with a horn, and I'd learned it for two weeks. And all I could think about was, you know, we may have to dance in this thing, and I really need to. I don't want to look bad. I want to look right. I know she's a dancer, and she can probably help me. But I need we need to go like get to some of that music. And I said to her that day, all I could think about was that. I was like, yeah. hey, you know, I, we need to do this. And she said, let's do it. And. Uh, I think so it was that a was Friday night. It was a Friday night. It was that was Let's I went work to work on, on a Wednesday? Dancing? I went to work on a Wednesday. We we worked we worked Wednesday and Thursday on the the musical stuff in the scene, and we worked Friday and Friday night. We we went out to go find a place. I had to you know find the place. I'm I'm not a good date guy, so I was like, wow, how do you how do you even do that? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah. So I finally uh, found that was the Playboy Club, and uh, you know uh, did the Playboy Club, went to the Playboy Club to, to do the dancing. Sat down. About two and a half hours later, walked out. Never, never got up once. There was no dancing there. Yeah, I'd blown that, and I didn't care. Neither she. And two and a half hours later, we were we were uh, on That's our way, it. on our way to thirty four years. <laughs> What's know? so that was a pre at the time. 
huge celebrity couple during the era it, it when wasn't. celebrity couples start Actually, it wasn't. coming. And no, it wasn't. Why um, do you Goldie say that? Hawn it wasn't. Was a huge celebrity. I was a, 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 a well-known actor who had been around, and uh, I was not Warren Beatty. I was not Jack That's Nicholson. That's fair, but it was and, still and, no, two no, no, name when, people. No, when dating. you're not that guy, and the the Hollywood zeitgeist kind of wants that to be there, it wasn't an immediate acceptance. It was interesting, and then it quickly became oh wow, and and at that point, you know, um, I began to my career began to be going in a different uh, on a different trajectory. Yeah, and then that fit. Uh, but yes, over the next. <laughs> Over the next long period of time, yeah, uh, we, we became... Paparazzi uh, immediately? Yeah. Your life changed? Yeah. Well, I always had a good way of being able to kind of move around. You can't do that with Goldie Hawn. You, yeah. You know, it's just not that... that and and then those days... Especially was, in 1984. It was immediate. Yeah. And then it became... Then I be, be, became more well-known myself, and, and um, you know, it became increasingly uh, the situation... Uh, and it was just always we just it was a, in the beginning it was tough for me because it was like wait a minute <clears throat> I don't know if I want to sign on for this but it didn't matter because if you're in love you, you're going to figure out a way to deal with it you better figure out a way when to did deal you with. hit the stage where you're reading stuff in magazines or whatever that just is completely not true oh well, that's happened the, since I was ten <laughs> why <well, I'm> not <laughs> the right. press never tells the truth they're not interested in the truth they're interested in what they want to say. <laughs> It's just the way it is. Sometimes it can be good for you. Sometimes it can be bad for you. Sometimes, you know, and what happens is sometimes you just look at it in amazement and go, of course, my favorite thing about that is, and I'm going to just, I'm just going to pick a name here when I get to it. It's not, it's not, it's not going to be connected or true or anyway. All right. But this is my theory on that. Because it's, I have to look to myself, like look in the mirror. I remember going to the, uh, you know, you read stuff about yourself and you go, you've got to be kidding me where did that come from how, how could they even dream that one up i mean what what you know this that's amazing yeah <clears throat> and i always and i became very well known for just saying yeah 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 i did that yeah that was me yeah i just said i'm gonna say yes to everything and they'll let you guys parcel it out because it's none of it's true so it doesn't make any difference to me or those close to me it's just not that's just not what happened that's just i i, I don't even know that person or that didn't that situation i wasn't even in the country at that time whatever it was and so you know it's completely insane and i always kind of you know think it's kind of funny yeah and then at other times it's not it's kind of aggravating but you just go whatever and um but i'm that person who goes to the Grocery store, local grocery store. And then there's the whatever, the National Enquirer, or the Star, or the Globe, or whatever it is. They're all right there, right? And you're waiting in line, and, you know, because you got, you know, you, bought, you got three packs of cigarettes and an apple, right? And, <laughs> and so you're waiting in this line for the, the woman who's got the three babies and, and, and all, the, all the, you know, baby diapers she's got to get through. And so you got nothing to do, and you're reading, and I open it up. And now I, I've, I've read so many things about myself or people that I know that are just completely insane, right? But I'm the guy who goes there. Open it up and you're flipping around and you go, oh, well, that's kind of crazy. Uh, gee, John Travolta. Yeah, you know, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> kind of, you know what? Yeah. God. Damn. You just talk yourself into it. No, yeah. you immediately buy it. You yeah. immediately go, yeah, whatever. You flip the page and there, there's another one about you and you go, what are they talking? What are they doing? <laughs> what are they- <laughs> And so you, when it's about you, you know that you know that it's insane. But when it's about somebody else, you have this tendency to just go, uh huh. You know, I've even had, you know, my family, my mom, and my sisters, and I say, guys, guys, just don't, don't. It's just what they do. And now in the age of the internet, it's I guess even more so. I don't know. I don't. I don't kind of. Yeah, I, stuff, think, so I, never, you know, I think that was a better it's been time. So long now, and now it's that. I must say that's kind of like history. So. Nice we, I, I did a bad job of pacing because we have more movies to go through and we're going to run out of time. Go through and we'll do You tell me. I well, got, you got to tell me I got 30 seconds and I'll do it in 30 seconds. What's, I'll try to give you the highlight. Best in times, that's your first sports movie. But let's Robin Williams really quickly. Tremendous talent. And finally had to go to Robin and say, Robin, I have to have this conversation with you. He said, what? I said, every time you tell a joke, I, I'm just telling you right now, I think it's incredibly funny and you're incredibly funny doing it. But I can't go through every day laughing all day at your jokes because I'm afraid if I don't, you're going to keep working at it and, and you're going to wear <laughs> Trying to win you over. I yeah. have to do, I have to just do my part, but I yeah. just want you to know, I think it's hysterical. I think you're hysterical. It's hysterical. <laughs> and just know that because 
sometimes I'm just going to walk away and be thinking about something else. But you don't have to, you know, you don't have to think. I didn't think it was funny. He was great, funny. Um, he was just wired like that all the time. Exhaustingly so. Yeah. Yeah. He just Ex- had to always make people laugh all the time. Exhaustingly so. Yeah. 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 Um, Tequila Sunrise. Uh, uh, you played really, the part that was was it written for Pat Riley or did you consult no, Pat it, Riley? What was it that was deal? Written probably as Bob. I've heard Bob talk about Bob Town talk about that a little bit. That, that Another Riley great was his 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 impression in his head. Yeah, in his head, and he, and I think he was interested in casting Riley. That we never talked about that much, but I worked closely with Bob on that. Because you had the Riley hairstyle in that movie. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I listen. I, I. It's like I love to do that with directors. It was weird that you were it's carrying like, a clipboard, though. It's that, like, I didn't well, who's your, that. who's your, um, who's your, you know, I like to ask the director, who's your perfect casting, so that I can understand what's in your head that you're going for, so that I can kind of understand that, you know, and you're not gonna hurt my feelings. I just want to know where you, where, where you were going in your head, and uh, it was a tremendous opportunity to work with. Maybe the best screenwriter we've ever had. I don't know. He's been referred to that many times. I think he's phenomenal. I think I learned from him how to read a screenplay and work on a movie. And not only the desire for all actors to have uh, not the plot move the story, but their characters move the plot. He, he's so deeply into the character so quickly that the, what, what, what the character doesn't say moves the plot. I learned that from him, from watching that with him. Mel Gibson and I became friends on that movie. I, I, I just think the world of Mel. Um, I think he's one of the funniest people I know. He's, he's a very interesting man. Smart. I would say. And yeah, no, he really is. I mean, he really is. He, he's, <clears throat> he, he, he has taken, it's a bit like, I understand Mel, because I come from a world of baseball where the sense of humor is absolutely slicing and barbaric at times. And I think deeply funny because it gets to the core of something about you and or the situation. Mel has some of that, to me, he has some of that culture from Australia, the Australian male. There's a culture there that's very different from the American or English or Spanish male. It's it's Australian and it is unique. And I think Mel carries that with him, what he what he somehow grew up with there. And as an American, he has an interesting combination of it. He can turn a phrase with anybody. And I just think sometimes what other people would find not funny, I would find absolutely, I did find and do find it hysterical. And I think he's a spectacular director. And um, all praises. Couple drinks on the set with Mel? I can think of no more fun way of spending uh, a a month a month on an island than with mel and endless boxes of beer and booze and having just saying let her rip babe i want to hear it all i just think because it now will it will you get to the point where you're going mel 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 come on man it's like sure that's that's i don't know i i guess i'm a little looser in that regard i come from an era where we weren't quite so precious i think people's Feelings get. I, I just think we live in a time now where I, I kind of look at that and just I've I've learned to kind of walk away and be quiet because I realize that I mean I, I should say I've learned but I haven't succeeded. I mean I still say things that to me are you know it's like I I like I think it's funny as hell and somebody else might go God come on right that's awful and I go well what I'm, it's not it's a it's I'm literally not I'm basing it on reality don't tell me it's not but I'm. <laughs> Just making a farce out of it. Don't you get that? I mean, and by, by, as, as that trillionth of a second thought goes through your head, you just say, ah, oh, fuck it. Won't go away. People are very uptight in 2017. What's that? They're very uptight in 2017. Gee, you think? Yeah, <laughs> I do. <laughs> this, my mom and I talk about this a lot. My mom's like, oh, these these people. Oh, God. I, oh. Well, it's just generational. We, yeah. I mean, you know. Your it's, generation it's, was a lot more seat by the pants, let it fly, yeah. tango and cash. Sly, Sly Stallone? Just Sly, all about Sly. And uh, Swayze decided not to do uh, Tango and Cash. My uh, brother-in-law was producing it and found out immediately. He said, God, this would be great for Kurt. He'd be great for this movie. And Sly liked me and because and, uh, I had met Sly before. And I really liked him. I just We got, got along. We had good laughs. And he Sly was all for that. And, uh, you know, very quickly I was 
doing that movie. I wanted to do it because I wanted uh, I wanted the mix, the opportunity, and the guilt by association of being a movie star. I needed that. I needed to be in an A-list action flick. I just needed to be connected to that. Yeah. And Sly was the perfect guy to do that with because we were good we were good foils for each other. And um, it's on a lot. Have fun. Boy, it's on a lot. Have fun. It did well. It's on, it's on oh, like yeah, it's year a 15 30. year old boys. Well, it's a, it's a it's a movie for 15 to 17 year old boys. I mean, that's your core audience and we knew that and Sly was completely, you know, he's completely locked into an understanding of that. And, yeah. uh, he was just, he, I was, uh, you know, treated, uh, amazingly well by Sly. He was great. I period flat out fantastic. And I, I love seeing him puts a smile on my face and, uh, a big feeling of uh, fondness in my heart. Every time I see him and think about him, he's, I just really like him. It might be the most sarcastic action movie of all yeah, time. Yeah, it's definitely yeah. in the top three. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. there's yeah. a lot of sarcasm there's flying of, around. Yeah, there's a lot fists of fists and sarcasm. Yeah, like <laughs> <laughs> that could have been the name of the movie. Um, what was your biggest what if that was in Bull Durham then? Because you said like that what one, if? that one somebody else could have taken Tango and Cash. Is there a movie that you were like? Oh man, I almost got that one, or I could have done that, but I was oh, scheduling conflict. Oh, there were a lot of movies I didn't do because uh, either it didn't fit into my into my life at that time. Yeah. Uh, or I didn't. Uh, there was something about the movie I didn't I that turned you off. Yeah, that I wasn't going to feel comfortable doing. Yeah, so, what, of, so what's the biggest? I don't uh, want to say well, regret. It's, but, you know what? I get asked that question all the time, and I don't come like on. it. Here, there's two reasons I don't like it. Okay. I don't like another actor learning that. It's not a right. good. It's not a good feeling. Okay. For them, I've learned that. Um, I've named a couple of them in the past, and I've learned to just keep my mouth shut about that. It's not. I, I turn a lot of them down for a lot of different reasons. Um, and it doesn't matter. It, 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 it again, ifs, ands, and Peter Pants. Who cares? Not me. And I have no reason to tell someone. Go, Wait a minute. I didn't. I wasn't the first choice of that movie that made me famous. I wasn't. A lot of actors are offended by that. I. I'm, I'm not. But. Um, they are, and I and I kind of understand why. Yeah. Um, suffice it to say, there's been a lot of them. I have no regrets over not doing any of them. I have no regrets. I, my, my life is, you know, my life. You, you're going to live your life. It's going to do what it's going to do. You're going to have whatever amount of control you have over it, and you're going to do things that are right and things that are wrong, and uh, in terms of what was best for your career and all that. I just wanted a varied one. I wanted to do things that other people maybe wouldn't be interested in, but I was interested in. And I continue to do that. Yeah. And um, it's the only way I know how to stay interested in this field. You know, and I, I've been fortunate in that I've been able to many times do it. Are there things you want to do that you don't get? Of course. Sure. Absolutely. That's the game. Let's go 30 second shot clock. Backdraft. Always wanted to work with Ronnie Howard ever since we were young men. I mean, going way back. Oh yeah, and you he's guys the were nicest child guy actor in the world. Pierce. Yeah, and he yeah. Was just a, he's just a, and, and he'd become this really strong director. <clears throat> we had gone to each other with a couple of projects over the years that we either he didn't want to do or I didn't care to do, and along came this one, and uh, had the opportunity to work on it as a, a, to work on the character in a, in, in form of in the form of writing, uh, with uh, I believe his name was Greg Wyden uh, for Ronnie. Uh, and that, and 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 the experience with all the players, uh, Billy Baldwin standing out, who's again a, just a sweetheart, <laughs> just a sweetheart, a great guy. All those guys were great. A great bonding experience with all the actors and firemen in that movie. And I thought that we had a challenge, which was to make firemen cool, and we did. Escape from L.A. Thirty seconds. Uh, only real sequel I ever, only real sequel to a, to a movie they did. The people uh, just wanted it. They weren't going to be denied. For a long time. Yeah. And we did, it. there were some interesting things about that 17 years later, 17 years after, uh, in Escape from New York, it was 17 years into the future. Yeah. 17 years after that, we did Escape from LA. I was now getting older and I wanted to look, I, did, I didn't want, I would never want to do Snake if I didn't look right. And I had I had a couple I had one or two years left to where I could do it and um, and John and I had again a, a, just a terrific time working together. I love working with John Carpenter, yeah. and that was what that was. Uh, Tombstone, being Snake again was pretty cool too. Um, Tombstone was a very difficult experience. Uh, it was a grind. 
it was unfortunate in that we our director um, uh, just was uh, uh, he, he was a spectacular writer and he was as weak a director as he was good a writer and we had a who was the director uh, what was a man named Kevin Jar who was a great writer and he was getting his opportunity to direct and it just was it just was not working and uh, so it, it, you know he, he had to be re replaced and, and and a lot of it fell on my shoulders in terms of I had gone out and got the money for the movie yeah with Andy Vanya another wonderful human being and uh, gave us all the opportunity <clears throat> to do a western which nobody really you know cared that much about and uh, I thought that that cast those actors uh, who very few of them have any idea of really what was going on in some ways on that movie because it just couldn't be told. And I promised I would never tell some of it. Uh, and I'll hold true to the promise. But the actors were great. Billy Paxton amongst them was just a great human being. Yeah. Uh, but Sam Elliott was fabulous to work with. Uh, all the, I, just, I can go through all the list of guys, but I have to say, my relationship from minute one with Val Kilmer was... One that I'm glad I, I'm so glad I've had in my life. Uh, he's really smart, very talented, and oh, what a joy to to be with. And he can also drive you completely crazy, which is I I think you got to have in a great relationship. I can we went to Spain, we went all over Europe actually promoting, and Goldie was with us. And finally, it's there would be these times where I'd say, Val, I can't hear one more word. You take you and Goldie go out tonight. <laughs> You guys go out and do the town. I cannot listen to one. And he laughed. And he, go, ah, he, well, he called me something blockhead. I think it was blockhead. Well, you blockhead. You're not going to ever come off of that position. Uh, I love him. I just uh, think the world of Val. And he uh, is a fascinating guy in that uh, there's a lot of relationships Val's had with people that, uh, boy, they would listen to this and they go, I don't know what he's talking about. Val is... Uh, different person and uh, he's unique and he's uh, I, I found him to be one of the most compelling actors to work with in terms of his vision of what these people were and who they were to each other and why uh, endlessly interesting and, and a great hang who's more fun at 4 30 in the morning after like 15 drinks Mel Gibson or Val Kilmer That's a toss-up. <laughs> Val, Val might not be drinking. He might be doing something else. Yeah. <laughs> Mel and I will be drinking. Val might be doing something else. You know, you're getting into the ayahuasca world, possibly, with, with, with Val. You know what I mean? It's good. It's going to... It's That's a good one. That's a good night, actually. <laughs> Take that to the bucket of blood. <laughs> good Sorry. guys, man. Dark Blue, 2002. Great opportunity to have a chance to work with uh, Ron Shelton on a very different kind of a movie. One of my favorite characters that I ever had the opportunity to play. Let's do it. Miracle. Miracle was a mediocre screenplay that had no um, opposite uh, side to uh, one, of its, one of its two. You were watching two things. You're watching a coach, a man, and you're watching a group of, of young men. The group of young men aspect of it was really pretty good, but we already knew their story. The group, as opposed to the one man, we didn't know that story and we didn't know the man. I met her Brooks because uh, uh, with Gavin O'Connor, the director, great talent. Also great knowledge because he played high level football. It was it's important in that movie to understand we're gonna have to teach you some things. And you gotta understand some of the aspects of the psychology and the personalities that that and how they deal with high level sports, things that matter. And I had the opportunity to meet Herb Brooks because he was coming out to Vancouver where we were living, because our son was playing junior hockey in Canada, which is a religion up there. And he was coming Herb was coming out to scout. One of the things he was doing was scouting goaltenders and why it was one of them. So when we met, we <laughs> we spent the first like hour and a half, two hours talking about Wyatt. And there were all these Disney guys around and they found this kind of looking and I and Herb said, uh, and I said, yeah, we got we to get down to some business here. And I see, and so I'm thinking, I was like, okay, well, I don't know, I guess this is the most fun year of your life. And he looked at me, it was like the two hours we had just discussed was like, well, are you an idiot? And I, because and I, I, I didn't know the story, and I just knew it was in the script, and and what I'd watched, of course. 
do you believe in miracles and all that? And he looked at me and he said, are you kidding me? And I, I said, no, I, I don't know. He said, it was the loneliest year of my life. And I remember looking at Gavin O'Connor and saying, we have some work to do. And was able to get a lot from her, his dilemma. He was a man who had three national championships, a future in the NHL, and he was putting it all on the line for a concept that nobody else was buying into. Yeah. It was tremendous. He wasn't just Simon Legree whipping the boys, going more, 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 more. No, it had to be put into context. And it was nothing. There was really nothing in the screenplay about what the coach was doing behind the bench. So it didn't matter. We had to work on that. And uh, I think that uh, I love that movie. It's also one of my favorite performances from Kurt Russell because I got the greatest accolade I've ever gotten out of that, which was when we went and had the premiere, uh, Herb's grandson, who was like three years old at the time, about, about four or five minutes into the movie, I was sitting not too far from them. I heard his little voice go, Papa! Or Poppy, I forget what it was, Poppy or Papa. And he was pointing at me, and I said, that'll do that, that'll do it for me. You, you nailed what my review would have been of that movie if you had asked me. Mediocre script, you were great in it. It's a mediocre script, it's not a mediocre movie. No, it's I disagree not. with you if you think it's a mediocre movie. I said I think, mediocre script. Yeah, yeah, but you so said I, I, mediocre yeah, script. Yeah, I agree with that. I think the movie worked, yeah. but and, I think and, and, it worked because you were putting, good. I'm it. not laying something on the writers. I mean, yeah. I think they wrote the basics. Of what, what are you going to do? But there were some things that we needed to change, take out, put in, like you do on all movies. There's nothing different about Miracle in terms of that, in terms of the, you know, in terms of the working on a script. But in particular, it needed you needed to know what Herb had at stake, so right. that every time you're with Herb, you just didn't want to get back to the guys. It was like, okay, got it, Herb. You're, you know. You got it, you know, you want to win. Got it. No, you got to understand what somebody's putting on the table that they may lo- that they may lose for their entire life and and that was fascinating. I happened a very weird thing happened there. I'm a pilot and I was flying on the day that Herb was killed in his car accident. And I was flying from I believe Muskoka, Canada to Los Angeles. And I looked back on the time. I found out the time we died. I was almost directly over him when what? he had that car accident. Yeah. Yeah. That's very bizarre. I've never told that story before, but wow. it was, I, fig- I looked on my logbook and I kind of worked it back and I was within a, within a four or five mile range of, you know, at, uh, what would I be? I would have been at 28,000 feet. And, uh, yeah, it was bizarre. That's amazing. Yeah. I think the problem with a movie like that... I wish you would have seen that. I wish you would have been able to see it. You have, you have, first of all, you're competing against the memory everyone had from 1980. So that's obstacle one. Then obstacle two is it's this team of 22 hockey players, and it's just in a two-hour movie. It's tough to keep everyone, just keep track of everyone, which is why the coach yes, that's, and whatever the por- performance is Gavin is going to carry the movie. Yeah. That's Gavin O'Connor doing that. He made you know who those people were. By the end of it, yeah. By, by you knew who was who. The coach you, has to be awesome. In well, that you movie also though. knew by the end of the movie, you knew enough about hockey to realize that the last four or five minutes, you're playing defense. You're trying to prevent the. You're trying to hold on to the right. victory, and and you, the audience, understood. You know, there's not a lot of people that are going to understand the intricacies of defensive hockey. And Gavin O'Connor had the, the, the difficulty of trying to subtly teach the audience through the personalities of the people and through the coach's wishes and desires and way and style. You you learned enough that by the time you get to the you're you're just sitting there going, hold on, guys, yeah. hold on. And that's what that was going. That's what was going on in that arena. And that and when you're watching at home, it was the yeah. longest nine and a half it was just, minutes oh, of God. all time. It wasn't. It, it took was five it was hours. Just, it was t- it was ten ten minutes. So yeah. It was nine and a half minutes of 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 one. You know, it's like oh God, please the clock let was just this going. be. And it's a, it, and they were a juggernaut. That team was. Yeah. I think they'd won forty eight games or something like that in a row. Yeah. Internationally, I mean, it was that's like an eighth grade team beating the Yankees in the seventh game of the World Series. It, it just it was that it was that crazy. It's the greatest tape delayed sports moment of my life. I agree, and I I. <laughs> It was real simple. They outworked them. Yeah. It was a real, at the end of the day, the complexities of the game all mattered. But the work those guys put in, he, Herb realized something. I got young legs. If I can build those young legs up and I can get them to believe in themselves in, in terms of what I think will work, we can outskate them. And that was, that was a genius concept. It was like, what? 
Nobody can out skate. It's the it's a, it's ice hockey. Yeah, you have to skate. These guys are the greatest skaters uh, in in game terms in the world. And he he they, they warm out. Um, you took you took like a four year break from 07 to 2011. Where you was it a retirement or a sabbatical? No, I got interested in wine. I'm sitting on a I'm doing Death Proof with Quentin Tarantino, and then this this is he's my favorite. Uh, filmmaker, I, I, yeah. I, I just think he's, uh, I think he's a Orson Welles of our time. I think he's great, and he's a blast, and he's brilliantly talented. And I'm doing Death Proof, having a ball, playing this stuntman Mike character, just just having a ball. <laughs> but I've always wanted to make wine, and <clears throat> um, a friend of mine was talking to me about it at the time and saying, you should, you know, if you're going to do this, you get, you need to get going on it. I said, yeah, I do. I just don't know how to do it or what to do in it. And I, now I'm sitting there with Zoe Bell strapped to the hood of the car We're for three weeks, and we're going to be doing this scene. And I'm driving, and she's sitting there, and we're talking. And behind her, I'd always look at the, where I was just off the side of the road with the walkie-talkie waiting for them to say, come on. Hopefully they've shut down all the roads because we're going to literally be doing 90 to 100 going down this road and hopefully and the you know the camera cars in in one lane you're in the other and there's no room for anybody else coming the other way so yeah I mean, hello and um but as i was waiting i'd always be looking at this vineyard <coughs> sort of daydreaming thinking god like man, i'd love to own a vineyard i'd love to make one the next year i met the, the people who owned a vineyard in santa rita hills california because i wanted to make pinot noir and i wanted and i i I, I wanted to make a Burgundian style Pinot Noir. I know. Oh, I, wow, you're getting super I just, technical on I me. I just knew what I wanted to do. Yeah. But I had no idea how to do it, go about it. Through a, a man named Greg Gorman, who it was an old acquaintance who was a great uh, photographer, he introduced me to um, Peter and Rebecca Work, who own Amplos Cellars at Amplos Vineyard. Yeah. Amplos Vineyard was the vineyard I was looking at when I'd sit on that corner. So now I've had the opportunity to start making wine with that vineyard and those people. And Peter, in particular, um, kind of took me under his wing, as it were, and I became their their uh, an, a, 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 a wine apprentice. And they let me make the kind of they help teach, and continue to teach me, and help me uh, reach some of the goals that I want to reach in terms of winemaking. And my Gogi wine, G O G I, is my wine. Um, people can always ask me where can I go. I go to gogiwines.com, and. Uh, I, my wine is taken off. I mean, I, I make a really good high-end Pinot. I'm going tomorrow to the Disney Wine and Food Festival uh, for three days. And they have my wine at the best restaurants around Disneyland, Disney World, uh, Shanghai Disney. And it's also all over Los Angeles and some places in San Francisco, Wally's. And it's, it's, it's all around. I mean, my wine is growing, and I'm very proud of it. And I have my, and in, nowhere on it other than on the back is my name. I'm, it's not a... This is not a situation of a celebrity slapping a horribly slapping an, a, a name on a bottle and making a claim. I love the whole world of learning, m being a part of making, blending, whatever, every, any, farming, anything has to do with wine. I, I, I just, I love it. And that was, I, I, I preferred the fun that I was having doing that to the screenplays I was reading. And I'm fortunate. I, I you know, made enough in my life to have my life uh, I'm stunned by this Pinot I had no idea yeah if you like Pinot go for go I love Pinot Pinot's my favorite I've probably you, had Pinot, you like Pinot Noir Pinot's my favorite oh well okay my Pinot's made for Pinot drinkers it's a complex mal uh, like like we can get for, like, I have a whole lot <laughs> stop <laughs> <laughs> this doesn't sound like a commercial in five seconds but if you like Pinot Bill that's that's the deal go my ahead. mom is uh, a wine lunatic <laughs> There are wine fans and wine lunatics, and my mom's a wine lunatic, so I've had it Where basically the last thirty. You in California, I'm in LA. My mom's in uh, in Beverly Hills. Okay, well you're but you're, yeah, so she's I've, okay. I've that's go to Wally's. I I eventually I've been to Wally's. Go to Wally's and say hey, I'm looking for uh, if you can't remember Gogi. Okay, just say I'm looking for uh, Kurt Russell's. Wine. I think I'll and remember also, Gogi. And also, do you like Chardonnay? Nah, yeah, I do red. Okay. I'm, I'm well, done I do with red white. Too, but I've I retired love, I mean, from white. I'm getting more and more into Chardonnay too. I like that because I like Burgundy and white. So hmm. um, anyway, I did that from bicycle trips uh, with Goldie. Started learning that I there was, it was more. Tate, was that trip. the most shocking revelation of the podcast? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. I had no idea. Yeah. Uh, Kurt yeah. Russell. All right, we're wrapping up. 
Fast right. Eight coming out Friday, which I think is when we're putting 14th? up this podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah the 14th. And by the way. Are you going to be alive for a, Fast Nine? Can we say? I have no idea. Okay. I have no idea. I just sort of. Mr. Nobody? I have no idea. You know, I have no, I have no idea what they're going to do. Um, you know, talk about next time around. If all you care about each time is that movie. And I've seen it. It delivers. <laughs> <laughs> I can recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for coming on. This is great. All right. Cheers. All right. <laughs> all right. Thanks to Kurt Russell. Thanks to SeatGeek, our presenting sponsor. Thanks again to the Fly Delta app for sponsoring the show today. The Fly Delta app makes your entire flying experience seamless, real-time bag tracking with RFID, passport scanning during check-in, easy access to your boarding pass and gate info, and so much more. It's actually silly if you don't use the Fly Delta app. It's with you every step of your trip, giving you the timely information you need. Download the Fly Delta app and start flying in style. I don't need to do this. I already have it. Thanks to Sonos for epic sound you can feel from a speaker you'll hardly notice. You need play bass from Sonos. Play bass adds pulse pounding sound. Pulse pounding. I always have trouble with that one, Tate. To whatever's playing from movies and sports to TV, game, and music, and you don't even need to read the manual. The Sonos app guides you through every step of setup. One power code, cord, one optical cord. All it takes, everything. Sounds better on Playbase. See for yourself at Sonos.com. That is Sonos.com. Don't forget to go to the Ringer NBA show if you want to hear me break down the first round of the NBA playoffs with our friend Chris Vernon, who's already headed for, I think, a sad ending in round one with his Grizzlies. We're going to talk about that. Don't forget about my MVP column on TheRinger.com. Don't forget to catch up on our other podcasts. I did a mailbag on Monday, a one-man show. Tate chimed in a couple times where we just try to cover as many mailbag questions as possible. And then on Wednesday, Joe House and I went over the last vestiges of the MVP race, and we talked to Fast and Furious producer Neil Moritz. And if you like the franchise, I would highly recommend that one. Lots of tidbits. That's it for the BS Podcast. Go Celtics. Talk to you next week.